Uh, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our session, uh, Sharing is Caring, uh, GPU sharing and CDI and device plugins. Uh, my name is David Porter. Uh, I'm from Google. Uh, I work on the Google Kubernetes engine team, uh, where I work on uh, Node and kind of our integration with accelerators. And uh, this is Chris. Yeah, I'm Chris uh, Designotis. Um, I'm a software engineer at NVIDIA. I work on our cloud native engineering team that works on enabling GPUs in the container runtime ecosystem and in Kubernetes. Cool. So to get started, let me just kind of set the landscape. Uh, so the landscape, as everyone is well aware during this KubeCon, uh, devices are becoming increasingly important in Kubernetes, right? So we have all these new workloads, uh, things like inference, training, uh, fine tuning, et cetera, and all of them are requiring devices. Uh, so it's important that devices and accelerators are kind of well integrated in Kubernetes, uh, just like uh, other resources are today. So. Uh, what we're going to cover today, um, we're going to start by talking a little bit about uh, how devices are integrated in Kubernetes today. Uh, then we're going to kind of go one level lower at the container runtime level and take a look at how container runtimes integrate with devices uh, and how CDI is a new technology uh, that's going to help enable that. Uh, then we'll, we're going to go up the stack a little bit and look at kind of resource management uh, with some of these devices. And we're going to focus on GPUs and how uh, GPU sharing can be enabled. And lastly, we'll kind of end with a little bit about uh, the future of devices and device sharing uh, in Kubernetes. So I think uh, when we think about it kind of from the Kubernetes perspective, right, I think one of the big reasons Kubernetes is so successful and everybody uh, you know, really loves running Kubernetes is because it's really good at resource management. Uh, what Kubernetes allows you to do is take you know, your whole fleet of nodes, right, with all different types of resources like CPU, memory, disk space, and really allow you uh, to be able to manage them under one control plane with one API. And devices are now becoming increasingly important in that resource management space, and we want to enable you to manage them just as effectively as you do with CPU, memory, and disk today. So what we're trying to do from the community perspective is we're trying to build uh, open standards here and common resource models, both to actually consume and interact with these devices and uh, to share their resources. So we're going to be talking about what exists today. And what exists today is the device plugin framework in Kubernetes and CDI. Those are kind of the open standards and frameworks that allow you to interact with devices today. Uh, in the future, and uh, something that's been discussed during this uh, KubeCon has been a new feature called DRA. And DRA is going to be a new API, a new way to manage these resources and share them more natively. So let's talk a little bit about devices and Kubernetes. What, what is a device when we talk about uh, devices here? So a device, we'd like to think about it as kind of this abstract concept, an abstract resource that the user wants to use for some specific resource, uh, some specific purpose. And it may be uh, that it's a physical hardware device, but it may not be. And so usually these devices, uh, they don't just come in isolation. There's kind of a whole ecosystem around them. So usually if it's a hardware device, you'll actually need some kind of kernel, uh, you know, kernel drivers. You'll need to access some device nodes to actually talk to that device. And probably you'll need some libraries and utilities as well to actually be able to use that device in your application. So this whole bundle uh, of things is usually what we call uh, the device. And so in Kubernetes today, we have this API called the Extended Resources API. And the Extended Resources API allows uh, Kuber in Kubernetes to basically advertise uh, resources uh, in the, in the, under the node, uh, just like CPU and memory. And we can advertise uh, these devices and account. So the devices are countable and have an integer account associated with them. The way the devices are integrated in Kubernetes is with something called the Device Plugin Framework. And the device plugin framework uh, is a kind of a uh, plugin framework that the vendor of the kind of device usually writes. And so the device plugin framework usually has three calls here. It has a register call, an allocate call, and kind of health checking. So usually when uh, the device uh, starts up, it actually does some registration. And what this means is that uh, the device will start up, and it'll actually talk to uh, kubelet, and it'll advertise a name. So for example, for uh, GPUs, the name is nvidia.com slash GPU, and it'll advertise a count, how many of that resource we have. Then when a workload comes in, there's the allocation step. The allocation step is when we actually figure out what uh, device to allocate for that workload and how to modify the container so that the workload can actually access the device. So things are like uh, mounting the device nodes, the libraries, et cetera. And lastly, the device plugin is responsible for health checking, right? So if the device, plug if the device goes unhealthy, uh, the device plugin will react to that and update the node uh, about that. 
So let's walk through uh, kind of an example of how device plugins actually work in Kubernetes today. So let's start off here with a node. Uh, let's imagine we provisioned a node, uh, like either on-prem or in a cloud provider. You already have the GPUs attached to it. Uh, the first thing you would want to do is actually set up uh, the kernel GPU drivers here. So on a cloud provider, this is managed for you. There's also the NVIDIA GPU operator uh, that installs these drivers for you. So you set that up, you install it, and then you install the device plugin, which again, could be managed by a cloud provider or the operator. And the device plugin starts up, and the device plugin is usually just a pod that's running there. So the first thing the device plugin does is actually communicate with the GPU, uh, communicate with the GPU drivers, and figure out how many of those GPUs there are. Uh, from then, uh, the kubelet's going to go ahead and uh, basically see that there's a new device plugin and ask to do uh, the registration. So during the registration, uh, the device plugin is basically going to say, I have a resource. That resource name is nvidia.com slash GPU, like that's the name. And I have two of them. And uh, that's going to be communicated back to Kubelet. And when Kubelet does that, uh, sees that, it's going to go actually up to the API server on the control plane. And already, the Kubelet's responsible to update the node object capacity field. And it'll update the capacity field. And just in addition to your CPU and memory, you'll have a new entry there, uh, nvidia.com GPU 2. So at this point, all the components in the control plane can see that this, uh, that this uh, node has this resource attached. So at some later time, you have a workload that comes in, right? And this is on the left side of the diagram here. You have a pod come in. And under the container request there, uh, it'll request some number of that device. So the, in this example, it's requesting NVIDIA.com GPU 1. It'll come in, and then uh, it'll go up to the scheduler. And the scheduler is going to see, hey, this node has that resource available. It's going to go ahead and do that scheduling. And so uh, after it does that scheduling, the kubelet's going to see that, hey, it needs to start a new pod. At this point, Kubelet's going to communicate to the device plugin and actually do that allocation step I mentioned earlier. So it's going to figure out, hey, what GPU do I give it, and how do I make that GPU accessible in the container? What modifications need to be made uh, to the container to access that GPU? Once that's done, Kubelet goes ahead and goes to the container runtime. So this is like uh, container D or cryo, and actually send that uh, container spec there uh, for it to start. Container D uh, or cryo just pass it along to the low-level container runtime like run C. Run C goes ahead and actually starts the container, does all the mounting and so forth. And um, at that point, the workload can start. And now the workload can actually access the device, like the GPU. And at this point, the workload is directly talking to the GPU. It's not talking to any of these com Kubernetes components like the device plugin when it's actually running. Uh, however, with some devices, the story is not so straightforward and so simple. And so uh, Chris here is going to talk a little bit around some of the extra complexities and how CDI is going to help address them. Sure. Thanks, David. So yeah, so for more complex devices, there's actually more that comes into the picture than what was shown on the previous slide. So for NVIDIA GPUs, you not only need to install a driver and a device plugin, but you also need something called NVIDIA Container Toolkit, which is a set of tools that ensure that GPU containers can be set up with all the right things they need to, to access to GPU. So this diagram on this slide is just like a sequence diagram from the point when Kubelet allocates a GPU, one or more GPUs for your container to all the way down to when your actual container is run. Um, this is sort of what it looks like today and historically, right? There's um, some NVIDIA-specific components that, under the hood, make sure that your container has access to all of the right um, device nodes, uh, driver libraries, and so forth, so that your CUDA application can run transparently. Um, the, the, the major sort of um, component that's doing all the heavy lifting is uh, this, at step nine, this pre-start hook. So it's this library that's invoked as a pre-start hook before your container application, the main process starts. It has a lot of injecting of device nodes, mounting all the driver libraries and everything you need, and it's doing this sort of behind the knowledge of uh, a, a, a container runtime like Run C. So there's some downsides here. Um, one is this is not declarative. Like all of the edits to the container's environment are being happened under the hood, and they're not encapsulated in the container's spec. So the OCI runtime spec is the standard for that Run C uses to set up a container's environment. Run C has no idea that some of these things are actually being included in the container. So historically, that's led to some hard to debug issues and some inconsistencies when interacting with GPU containers. So ideally, we, we want to provide a standard um, to sort of overcome this and, and uh, do things in a declarative way. Um, and so there's a project called CDI, which aims to solve these problems and, and standardize how we access GPUs and, and other accelerators and hardware in containers. 
So what is CDI? It's a container device interface. It's a CNCF sponsored project under tag runtime. And like I said previously, it, it, it aims to standardize how containers or how uh, third party devices are made available to containers. Uh, the way it does this is it's, it uses a declarative specification and, and de it defines, in that specification you define, as a vendor, you define what your device actually means, what access in that device means. That can be a list of device nodes, mounts, environment variables, and even container runtime, or even container lifecycle hooks can be included, right? And each one of these maps to a set of modifications that need to be made to a container spec. Um, so everything is sort of encapsulated declaratively and um, right, it, it's, it's encoded in the container spec. Um, what happens is you request a CDI device and a container runtime which actually understands CD, CDI can take that device, read the spec for it, and modify the container spec, the OCI runtime spec, so that your container has access to the device. So it's all done uh, declaratively. The way that we name devices, there's a te taxonomy that CDI uses for naming devices. It's a vendor slash class equals name. So for an example for NVIDIA GPUs, it's a NVIDIA.com slash GPU equals and then some ID. We can use uh, arbitrary naming. So like I said before, um, this is a declarative approach and some of the main benefits are that low level runtimes like Run C are doing the heavy lifting for us, right? They, Run C is, is specialized in setting up a container's runtime environment, so we are leveraging it to actually provide access to accelerators and devices. Um, and having support in container D and cryo means that we no longer need some of the vendor-specific tooling to make this all work under the surface. So here's an example of what a CDI spec looks like for an NVIDIA GPU. Um, so this is a system where you have only a single GPU. So under the devices section, we just have one one um, entry called GPU zero, and we have a series of container edits. So these are edits that need to be made to your container spec so that you can get access to GPU zero. This is device nodes, like the NVIDIA character device, um, mounts, so like driver libraries like libcuda, right? It specifies where in the host that library is and where it should be mounted in the container, at what path. Um, as well as container lifecycle hooks. So a, a simple one is uh, updating the LD cache. So that this is a, a, a standard hook that we like to use so that your main process automatically can, can discover the, the driver libraries when it runs. So that's a brief introduction to what CDI is and what the, the goals of the project are and, and some of the benefits. Um, where can you use it today? So um, it's actually su supported uh, in, in Kubernetes. So that there were uh, a CDI devices field was added to the device plugin API so that um, device plugins, when they um, provide an allocate response, instead of providing other information, they can provide CDI device names in that uh, response field, in, in that response struct. Uh, the CRI was also extended to contain a CDI device field uh, in, in the container config message starting in uh, v0.27.0. Um, and like I mentioned, I think earlier, container D and cryo already support CDI, so they can understand the specification and modify a container spec um, for us. Um, so this has all been discussed in the context of Kubernetes device plugins, but CDI is actually a standard that's used outside and, 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 and is meaningful outside of uh, the device plugin use case. So for DRA, CDI is sort of the basis of defining and requesting resources. Um, it's also useful outside of Kubernetes. So if you're, if you're launching containers interactively with Docker or Podman, you can use CDI there. Uh, and actually for NVIDIA GPUs uh, with Podman, CDI is actually the recommended way today to, to access GPUs. Um, for HPC containers, so we already, there, there's been some support for CDI and Singularity, which is a popular um, HPC runtime. And we can think of even other use cases. So even for networking devices, we can imagine a future of using CDI for that as well. So going back to my sequence diagram from a few slides, this is how it would look with CDI, if, we, if, if our device plugin was leveraging CDI. Um, you'll notice that at the container runtime steps, there are no like NVIDIA specific components. Um, the assumption here is that before running applications, we have generated a CDI spec for all of the GPUs on the system. So either some tooling is, is invoked or um, 
Uh, the device plugin itself can generate these specs that describe all the GPUs in the system and what it means to access those. So those are stored somewhere as a file on the system, a standard path that runtimes know to look for. So that's done beforehand. But at runtime, what happens is container to your cryo, right, steps five through seven, it will read the CDI spec file. For all the requested GPUs for the container, it will update the container spec so that it has the right um, bits so that it can up access that GPU. It forwards that container spec to run C. Run C creates your container with that specification, and your container can run and has access to the devices that were requested. So this is all declarative. There's no vendor specific. So actually, this is a diagram that can be applicable for not just NVIDIA GPUs, but any other accelerator or device. Um, portable across container runtimes. And right, we're not using these vendor specific hooks that have a lot of drawbacks. OK, so we went into detail about device plugins and sort of the, the, the lower level details about container runtimes and some standards that are being developed. I think we're going to switch gears. I'm going to go back to Dave, and we're going to talk about how can we leverage device plugins to more effectively share GPUs. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so let's jump gears a little bit more uh, and go one level up. And so you know, with these devices, it's becoming increasingly important to find ways to kind of maximize their utilization, right? So especially with GPUs, they're very expensive, they're limited, and everybody right now is trying to figure out how we can squeeze kind of the most from them, right? So to do that, uh, what we're really trying to do is to find ways that we can take these physical devices that we already have and be able to break them up and partition them so we can actually run multiple workloads simultaneously on them. And so we're going to be looking specifically at GPU and the ways that we can share GPUs today. And so there's three main ways that you can do that. Uh, the first one is called time slicing. Uh, the second one is called multi-instance GPU MIG. And the third one, uh, which is uh, kind of a newer one, is called CUDA Multiprocess Service MPS. So we'll go into each detail into each one, how it works, and kind of the trade-offs of when you might want to use which approach. So we'll start with the simplest one, which is time slicing. So normally, right, we just have a single workload that's, cons that's running on the GPU, just a one-to-one -one mapping, really simple. With time slicing, what we can do is we can first of all, define how many workloads we want to actually be able to run on the GPU at a time. So you can see at the bottom of that command line, you can see uh, there's a parameter there, max shared clients per GPU is 10. So in this case, we're basically saying we're allowing 10 uh, workloads to run on the GPU at that time. And so with time slicing, how it works is we basically have context switching. So a single workload runs, then there's a context switch, and then the second workload runs, and then it switches back. And so that context switch is a little bit expensive, but it allows us to actually run multiple workloads at a time. And so uh, the way it actually works from the device plugin perspective is instead of actually advertising before the physical number of devices, which was before what NVIDIA.com GP represented, now we're kind of advertising the virtual number of devices, so the clients that can be used. Uh, the other kind of thing about time slicing that's worth to mention, each workload gets its own uh, address space, but there's no memory limits enforced. So a workload can consume all the memory, and that can disrupt other workloads. The other thing worth to mention here is that in time slicing, each workload actually only runs uh, at a single time, right? There's only one workload that's running. So there's concurrency here, but no parallelism. At a single time, there's only one workload that's actually running on the GPU. So that's available today, and you can use time slicing. Um, and then also, you know, with the NVIDIA GPU device plugin, the way to enable time slicing is pretty similar. Uh, you specify how many clients you want to use the GPU. Here it's 10. And now uh, under the NVIDIA.com slash GPU uh, capacity that's reported, instead of reporting one GPU, and now reporting 10 GPUs. So kind of the meaning here has changed uh, from the physical number of GPUs to the clients uh, that can use the GPU. So, uh, when is time slicing useful? So one uh, scenario where I think it can be very useful is kind of for interactive workloads, kind of more exploratory workloads. And so uh, sometimes uh, these workloads like Jupyter Notebooks, if you're familiar, where you can kind of do data science experiments and kind of machine learning kind of explorations are great candidates because they're kind of interactive. Sometimes they need a lot of resources. Sometimes they don't. You probably, they're mostly for exploration, so we don't have super strong kind of guarantees that we need to provide. So let's take a quick look at uh, actually using time slicing in action. So um, what we're going to do here uh, is we're first going to provision a uh, cluster. So we provision a cluster here on uh, GKE on 129. Uh, after that, I'm going to set up a, a node pool, uh, which is a set of nodes. 
and I'm going to configure those nodes to be in time sharing mode. So I'm going to specify the GPU uh, time sharing strategy, and I'm going to say that I have three GPUs that I want to do time sharing with. So I go ahead and create that node pool. Uh, it's going to create the capacity in the node. I'm just creating one node here kind of for demonstration purposes. Uh, after that's there, I'm going to use kubectl and actually see like how many nodes I have. So I'm running kubectl get nodes. I have uh, two nodes available here. Uh, one of them is just a CPU node, and then one is actually the one that we just provisioned with the GPUs. So I'm just going to send an environment variable GPU node just so we can kind of play around with it. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the allocatable uh, that's being reported uh, from the API server. And you can see here uh, we have NVIDIA.com GPU reported, and we have three GPUs uh, that are reported. So this node only has one GPU. It, I provisioned an A100 uh, GPU on it, so it only has one physical GPU. But due to the time sharing configuration, it's actually reporting that we have three GPUs here. So uh, let's go ahead, and uh, we're going to try running a workload here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to label the node with notebook node true, and I'm going to just use that as the node selector for the pods that I'm going to deploy. So uh, for the purposes of the demo, you can imagine here we're going to deploy two uh, Jupyter notebooks. And you can imagine maybe they're like two different uh, data scientists or researchers who are wanting to play around and use uh, these notebooks. So I created two pods here, notebook pod one. Uh, and in the node selector here, uh, you can see I'm specifying I want an A100 GPU. Um, you want to use time sharing. Uh, this is the one where I set up the, the three clients. And uh, from the resource perspective, I'm just specifying I need one GPU here. And then uh, for the actual workload, I'm just specifying like the, the Jupyter notebook uh, to start up. And so that's my first pod. And then I have a second pod here, which is basically the same thing, uh, just a different pod that we can play around with. Um, the only thing I'm running it under a different port so we can kind of uh, explore it differently. So uh, what we're going to do, we're going to deploy both of those pods here, notebook pod one and notebook pod two. Cool. And then we're going to look if those pods started up. They're running. Awesome. Uh, so now let's try to access those notebooks. So those notebooks, uh, I'm going to use uh, kubectl port forward, and I'm going to port forward them on two different ports. And so I'm going to start up the first uh, I'm going to go to that port forward and look at the Jupyter Notebook. You can see it started here on port 888. And the other one, I port forwarded on 889. And you can see it's also running here. So awesome. They're both running. Uh, but uh, they're using time sharing. But we're not actually using anything on the GPU yet. So let's actually run some GPU workload uh, to try out the time sharing. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to install some kind of libraries. And then I'm going to first of all use uh, PyTorch. And I'm going to access the GPUs from PyTorch. And the PyTorch is able to access the GPUs. I'm just printing the, the GPU kind of model here. So now let's try to actually run a workload. So I'm going to uh, use Hugging Face. Uh, so I'm just going to log in with the Hugging Face credentials so I can download a model. And I'm going to actually try doing a, uh, the, the Gemma kind of LLM model. So I'm using the open source uh, Gemma model, which is like the small 2 billion model here. And I'm going to try to do inference on it. So I'm going to type in Kubernetes is the best um, and try to run inference on that model. So I'm going to run it. Now it's actually loading the model to the GPU. Um, and you can see here it's going to load it here. And we can see the LLM output at the bottom. Kubernetes is the best way to deploy and manage containerized applications. Cool. So it makes sense. Uh, so now you can imagine some later time, like some other user wants to use that other notebook, right? So we're going to switch over to the other uh, notebook, different user. And let's say they want to run a different workload. Maybe they want to try a different model here. So very similar. I'm just going to try the same thing. But uh, this user, they're going to try a different model. They're going to try the larger uh, Gemma 7 billion parameter model. So same type of thing, uh, different model, though. And we're going to try a different input text. Type in Kubernetes is great and see what the response is. It says Kubernetes is great, uh, and it's hard. It's hard to get started. So hopefully uh, this talk uh, helps a little bit with that. Um, so there we go. We can see uh, we're running both of those things. If we look at the metrics here that are reported, we can look at actually the uh, metrics that are reported for those GPUs. Um, we can see the, the VRAM usage here. You can see it spiked to around 20 gigs, and then it jumped to 40. So uh, when we, the first notebook user started uh, playing around with the first uh, model, it allocated all that VRAM. And then the second one uh, started allocating more memory for the second model, and it jumped up to 40. And uh, just to verify that, we can actually log into uh, the node. And I'm going to just SSH into the node. I'm going to run NVIDIA SMI. And uh, you can actually see here from NVIDIA SMI, it shows like both Python processes running there and both uh, allocated that amount of GPU memory, which corresponds kind of to the metrics we saw earlier. Uh, so there you go. That's kind of like a demo of how you might use uh, time slicing. So you can try that out uh, today. So I'm going to hand it back to Chris to talk a little bit about some of the other GPU sharing strategies. Cool. Yeah, thanks for the demo, David. That was really great. Um, there we go. 
So there are two other sharing strategies we want to cover in this talk. So the next one is um, CUDA MPS. Um, this allows, this takes a next step uh, above time slicing in the sense that it allows you to logically, logically partition um, the GPU in terms of memory and compute. So uh, it's all done in software, just like time slicing. So you can have multiple clients to the GPU using at the same time uh, concurrently, but also it sort of allows you to do some level of parallelism. So you can have uh, clients A, B, and C running GPU kernels on the same GPU at the same time. And it's all sort of facilitated by MPS, this MPS service or server process that's running. And so it sort of sits in between uh, your actual clients and instructions running the GPU. So it, it, in software, it can um, sort of um, enforce some sort of memory limits or enforce memory limits with, for each GPU client and um, compute resources in terms of active thread percentage. Um, so it can lead to better utilization of your GPU in terms uh, when compared with time slicing. Um, and the, the one implementation detail is here is that we have one server that um, facilitates the, the, the GPU clients and, and running instructions on the GPU. So there's one shared CUDA context. Um, that's good in terms of context switching because you're, you, it's not as much of an overhead between different clients running the same GPU as one compared with time slicing where you are doing a full context switch between two, two different CUDA contexts. Um, but at the same time, uh, in terms of like fault domains, like this is a shared fault domain. So if uh, client A triggers some sort of fatal error on the GPU, it will affect clients B and C. Uh, in the NVIDIA GPU device plugin, you can configure um, MPS like this. It's almost very similar to the time slicing configuration. Uh, you just specify MPS instead of time slicing as a sharing strategy, and you configure how many replicas, so how many um, concurrent processes you want to, su to support running at the same time on, on the GPU. And so if we describe the node, we'll see similar to with time sharing, your one physical GPU is now um, advertised as, as 10, as being 10. Um, in terms of support, so we have a, a new release of the device plugin coming out very soon, the 0.15.0 release, and that will have official support for MPS. We have some release candidates out already that people are trying out, uh, trying MPS out with. The other uh, sharing strategy is MIG. So um, multi-instance GPU, right, it's a hardware feature of some of the later generation uh, NVIDIA GPUs that allows you to take a full GPU and subdivide it into multiple GPU, what we call GPU instances, right? And each of these has dedicated compute and memory resources. Um, so you can have up to seven of these slices um, on your GPU. And there's some uh, standard like profile names uh, that if you look at the uh, uh, MIG documentation, you can sort of partition your GPU into those fixed size slices. Um, so on the bottom, we have uh, an example of uh, enabling MIG on GKE. So on your node pool with A100s, you can specify the partition size of your MIG instances, in this case, 1G, 5GB, which is the smallest slice. So we can have seven of these, each with one sort of dedicated compute, um, GPU uh, compute instance and um, five gigabytes of of a GPU memory. Um, so how do we enable MIG in the device plugin? So the, the assumption here is that you, an admin or some, some automation has gone in and already enabled MIG on your GPU on the node and has already sliced um, the GPU into MIG instances. So that has to be done beforehand. So there is some static sort of configuration that has to happen. You have to sort of know what size profiles you want um, and configure the GPU in that way. Um, the configuration of the device plugin is really simple. The device plugin will actually enumerate all of your MIG instances. And so if you have seven of the, the small instance, uh, instance types, then your node will have uh, seven nvidia.com slash GPU resources allocatable. Um, instead of statically, or instead of uh, configuring MIG yourself, you can use the GPU operator. We have a component called the MIG manager that helps automate the, the the enabling of MIG and configuring of uh, MIG instances. So I'll hand it back to David, who's going to do a little comparison and summarize our talk. Cool. So now that you've kind of heard around those uh, different uh, resource sharing strategies, you might be asking yourself, when do I know which one to use and what are kind of the trade-offs between them, right? So 
I guess to start off, the simplest one is the one we started with, which is time slicing. Time slicing, the big benefit of it, it's very dynamic. So you can add workloads on the fly. You can remove workloads on the fly. Uh, you know, you can start out with just one workload, and then it's identical to just not not using resource sharing. And as you add more workloads, you can kind of uh, get more uh, workloads to share that GPU. The, the negative with time slicing is you can start to introduce some kind of jitter, et cetera, because of that context switching overhead. And you don't have strong kind of resource management guarantees because there are no memory limits that are available. So that's kind of what brings us to MPS. And MPS can be thought of as kind of an improvement over time slicing because uh, you actually do get stronger guarantees there, right? You do get uh, performance isolation. You can specify how much compute each, uh, each application gets. And you can specify memory limits. So you can actually enforce uh, memory limits per application. Uh, and then MIG is actually the one that gives you kind of the strongest guarantees because it actually partitions things at the hardware level, right? So that means that at the hardware level, uh, you have separate kind of memory that you can provide and you have separate kind of performance guarantees because it's actually split at hardware. Um, the kind of the negative with MIG and kind of the downside is that you actually need to figure out how to partition your GPU kind of ahead of time, right? And it's not dynamic. So when, when there's no workloads running, you have to kind of go in and understand, okay, depending on my workload size, which MIG partition sizes uh, make sense for my application. Uh, it works well, however, for, for example, for multi-tenant scenarios, right, where you really do need strong kind of security and other types of uh, isolation guarantees between workloads. So, uh, in summary, I think what we talked about today, right, is we started at the Kubernetes device plugin framework. And that's the existing uh, framework that exists in the ecosystem uh, to expose and uh, expose devices like GPUs, TPUs, and FPGAs. And we also dove one level uh, kind of lower at the container runtime level and gave you uh, some information about CDI, which is the new standard of how uh, devices will be integrated at the, at the container runtime level. Uh, then we looked at GPU sharing, and GPU sharing is a great way to improve utilization of your resources, and we have different strategies there with their different trade-offs. And I think the big message we're trying to send is, like, it, as a community, what we're trying to do is extend this resource model, um, make it really vendor agnostic, make it standard, and make it kind of natively supported by Kubernetes uh, with these devices. And so uh, what we're doing in the future is uh, we're trying to extend this model here, right? So this resource sharing, it's not natively supported and it's not very declarative because we had to kind of overload the meaning of what does the device mean depending on uh, the device, the, the, the resource sharing strategy. So we're trying to come up with new APIs to make it more declarative. And so in DRA, we're hoping that we can ex be able to express kind of some of these resource uh, sharing mechanisms kind of more natively. And so it'd be really great to get your feedback around kind of some of what are kind of the challenges today with the device plugin and, and CDI and uh, what, what you would like uh, in the future in Kubernetes. Your feedback is, is really appreciated there. And so a couple things I want to shout out is there's some related talks, uh, both at this KubeCon that have already happened and in past KubeCons as well, uh, that go in more detail around devices in Kubernetes as well as uh, GPU sharing, which are uh, some great resources there. Uh, so thank you so much. Any questions? Cool. I think there's mics, yeah. Uh, can, hello. Uh, can we expect in some future that you provide a memory limit or so for, uh, for uh, time slicing? It's technically possible, but it's not implemented in, in the driver. Yeah, I don't think that's currently planned. I think what some folks do is they actually enforce those memory limits at the application level. So a lot of applications, you know, you can actually enforce memory limits at the application level. Uh, but I don't think there's currently plans to actually support that natively uh, with time slicing. And the recommendation would be to use MPS. Yeah. yeah thank you. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, so my question would be, can you combine MPS and time slicing either today or tomorrow? So saying that uh, I want to use MPS until the GPU is full, basically, and then start time slicing for additional workloads. I guess, yeah, theoretically you could. But in practice, I don't think we've investigated or documented how to do that for our cloud native users. Um, okay, so it's theoretically possible today, or? I think so, Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You can also combine, for example, like MIG and time slicing as well, right? So you can do yeah. time slicing uh, on MIG partitions as well, for example. Yeah, you would need like multiple MPS server processes, right? To, and then they would time slice. But all their, yeah, I, I think it's theoretically possible, yeah.
So the example you gave, um, I guess it's now fractionalization is becoming a standard. Um, can I use those features in the new operator without DRA? I mean, this is enabling DRA, but I can still do these things now, right? Yeah, so everything we showed is not using DRA. This is using yeah. the device plugin API. So all the sharing strategies we showed you are available and supported in the operator and the components that we deploy. Yeah. And the new operator is about to be released with support for, I think you mentioned earlier there was a new version of that operator. Yeah, so we're, we're releasing a new version of the device plugin, and then also the operator will pick that up next month sometime, hopefully, to support MPS. Okay, so if we all start learning to use this way of allocating fractions, then in a, in a year's time or so, the DRA will be the new way instead? So the array will provide potentially like a new API to actually consume these in your workload. So your pod spec may change. But yeah. the underlying actually technology of the, you know, those different research strategies, that's not specific to DRA. DRA is just kind of the, the declarative API representation of how we want to consume those. OK. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the presentation. So my question is, is it possible to share something about how GKE supports the time slicing is the mechanism? Is this possible? H how, how it's implemented, you're asking? How GKE uh, supports time slicing? Yeah, so the way GKE supports time slicing is kind of the regular way. It's same as with the NVIDIA GPU device plugin. So you just specify how many clients uh, can use the, the GPU at a time, right? And then it'll basically just schedule those, uh, those workloads there. And the device plugin will advertise the number of clients that you specify. So there's nothing kind of special done uh, on GK versus the NVIDIA device plugin. The underlying mechanism is, is kind of the same. OK, thank you. Hi. Um, great talk. Um, at the moment, uh, we use uh, time slicing for, for a combination of GL workloads and CUDA workloads. Is that what we can also expect from, from MPS? To, uh, uh, I think it should work transparently, yeah. It's just a different way of sharing the GPU. I don't think the type of application you run necessarily matters. OK, yeah, because you mentioned uh, the context, and that sounded very CUDA-specific. Um, I actually don't know uh, if there's implications there of using the same CUDA context. I actually don't know. Okay. Yeah. M my understanding, the goal is for it to be compatible like for most workloads mm -hmm. out of the box, right? So I think the expectation you shouldn't need to change your, your workload significantly to, to pick up MPS. From, from time slicing, yeah. And, and the, the GL workloads, will they remain to be supported? Because we're, we're noticing a bit that the support for the container-based images, for, for example, for the, for the GL has been lacking for, for the last few years. So can we expect that to remain supported by, your, uh, by the cloud uh, runtimes? Are you asking about like the, the Docker image? Like what, what specifically? Yeah, ex exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not fully aware, honestly, around the, yeah, the me support either, there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll yeah. need to check. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hello. Thank you very much for the great talk. Uh, one question would be for time slicing. Is there, a, let's say, a soft limit depending on the cluster size and how many compute nodes you have uh, where it like, tanks the performance in, in a way? Yeah, so for, for time slicing, it's all kind of based on a single node, right? Mm -hmm. So actually, the number of nodes in your cluster and so forth, I, I don't think are mm -hmm. actually important factors. It's the number of workloads that are running concurrently, right, on, on, on a single node. So I think the main factor is how many GPUs do you actually physically have on that node and how many clients do you have connected to it, right? Uh, the, more, the more clients you're going to have, the less runtime each uh, workload so can you have. Can't shred, so you can't use time slicing uh, together with RDMA between, like, more nodes? Uh, RDMA connected no nodes to like have a super, uh, bigger a bigger pool of time slice GPUs. So yeah, I mean, I, I don't see why you couldn't use time slicing with other technology, right? When the workload is actually running on mm -hmm. the GPU, it's the only thing running, right? Mm -hmm. So you could use RDMA or any, t and, uh, any other techniques you're using today. Then, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thanks for the, uh, for the talk. Um, I have one question for, uh, for time slicing. It's currently the only solution that might have problems with workers fighting for GPU, um, for GPU consumption. So it is more agile than all the others. Is there a way currently to natively achieve process prioritization? So you can say, OK, these processes here are coming first, and then these are going to wait. Or is this not currently possible? Yeah. I don't think that's possible today. I think you can customize like the, the time 
quota that's given for each uh, application when it's time sliced. So I think there's a configuration option in NVIDIA SMI. You can say like short uh, for how you know the context uh, window, but you, I don't think there's prioritization built in there because okay. at, a, at a single moment, right? There's only one application that's running, and they all get the, the same share. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, if there are no other questions, thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you.